my message to you, I'm going to start a new one. Uh, we do kind of a Bible study format more or less on, Thursday, on a Wednesday nights. And what I mean by that is I usually look for a word, a passage, a parable, or something that's going to help us, you know, that we can study that can put a little bit more uh, oomph, a little bit more juice, a little bit more uh, power in our faith life. And so uh, we're going to do that through, of course, the Lord's teaching was our, the greatest teacher of all. And so we're just following along with this teaching. But I find that oftentimes that when he said things, um, because it's, it was said in a different language and translated, sometimes you find a little bit, more, little bit more punch to it when you grab what he was trying to say and see it. And so that's what Revelation is. And um, so my series, I want to call it for these Wednesday nights up and coming, Believing is Seeing. Everybody say, Believing, Believing. is Seeing. Now, you know, you know the opposite of that is what people say is seeing is believing. That's what the world, that's how we grew up, amen? That's how we were taught. We want to see it, and we can believe what we see, amen? Well, that's not, also, that's not always true, but that's what we think is true anyway. But it was an old adage, you know, seeing is believing, and everybody kind of grows up with that idea in their mind. And, uh, you know, science tries to discover things. Of why do, why, what am I looking at? I want to see more. I want to discover more when I see something I've never seen before. And um, so, but God's kingdom works opposite of that. It's believing is seeing. And so we're going to kind of investigate what the Lord meant when he said things like that. Now, we're coming into a time here in the word where this woman had just been prophesied by the Lord. He had had a word of knowledge and the word of wisdom for this woman um, at the well. And she was a Samaritan and and uh, she had no dealings with the Jews. Jesus went out of his way on purpose to capture this woman's heart. And he did so. And um, she goes back and she's telling everybody about it. And the disciples, along about verse 31 in John chapter 4, said, uh, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed to him and said, Master, eat. And they were obviously hungry. And he said, I have meat to eat that you don't know of. Therefore, said the disciples one to another. You ever notice how when they're confused, they never, <laughs> they didn't really want him to really know that they were really questioning what he just said. They were smart enough to not do that like we are. So they began to talk one to another. Sounds like the church. And uh, said, hath, this, hath any man brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. Say ye not that there are four months, then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages. That's pretty strong right there. And gathers <coughs> fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you entered into their labors. That's some pretty strong parable right there. So we want to kind of get a little bit more a little bit more something out of that that will maybe help us with our faith a little bit. It's about believing is seeing, not seeing is believing. And so he taught them that right here. Now, several things that we're going to kind of work our way through and to in this message tonight to kind of lay it out, um, grab some revelation out of it. Notice that, that he was talking to them. He always used something that was going on or a season or a time. He always used that as a launching pad for his teaching and so we know by that example that this is the time of year when it was time to sow all right and so he's using that time of season and and can you imagine him standing at a field that they had prepared they had plowed it up they had gotten it ready and they had sown the seed out there and the seed is falling on the ground and you know whatever they had planted and he's standing there at this field that you know, how many of you know that during that time, you know, the field is pretty, it's dirt, all the dirt's churned up, and it's fertilized, it looks real pretty, amen? 
And he tells them, he said, don't you see the harvest is already there? Isn't that amazing? Are you grabbing this now? This is the important part. He, he said, you, you, do you see? Now, what were they seeing in the natural? A plowed up field with seed sprinkled out through it. So it's in the time of year when, when, they're, when they're, they're planting. It was um, after the, past, you know, the Passover. After Passover, they would harvest, and then they would give it a, a couple of months, and then they would come back, and they would plant for the next harvest. All right? So we're in that time of year when Jesus is going to use now something to teach us about what it is to believe, and believing is seeing. Now he starts out talking about they're hungry, and he says, but my meat is to do. And that's the first revelation that really grabbed me about this passage, and I've told it to you before. You know, he said, my meat is to do. See, we always think that the that, oh, the meat of the word. Man, they're putting out meat, and we get all impressed with, with deep theology. Well, you know, it's not supposed to be that way. We're not supposed to be, though, you know, meat lovers. <laughs> you see, this is the kind of difference in the language, the way things are said, the way things are done. He said, my meat, what I live for, what I live on is to do something. Now, that's what the life of faith is all about. It's progressively doing something that is going to bring glory to God the Father. It's always aware that there's a blessing coming, that there's something that God wants to do. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And so he said, what I live for, my meat is to do, all right? You know what? That should be our meat. That should be the believer should get involved with that commitment of saying, you know, man, I, I, I want to do something that's going to bring glory to God. I don't, I don't want to just sit back and wait until I need something from God, and then I'm going to get proactive and interactive with God. I'm going to always be aware that, man, I'm doing something that's going to prepare for a harvest, for bringing glory to God, to bring fruit. Amen? And so he said, my meat is to do, to do what? The will of him that sent me. And notice this next little phrase. I love this. And he said, and to finish his work. Now, boy, I tell you, there are some that just don't buy into that. Boy, they're just, their theology, oh, God's work was finished. It's all finished. It's all finished. Well, Jesus just said he came to finish something. Or do you think he lied? He, he just said, I came to finish something. Finish what? The will and the work of him that sent me. Well, wait a minute now. You know, on the seventh day, God rested. His work was finished. Well, that's not what Jesus just said. There's always work to do. There's always the, the bringing so forth something. So what's he referring to here? Well, to finish his work. See, Adam didn't finish the work. Are you listening? You got to understand, this is, this is connecting the dots here, all reaching all the way back. Jesus had that wisdom to be able to do that so articulately, so amazingly to say, I'm finishing work. Now, that would cause you to so finish. You know, when somebody that studied, uh, you know, from Genesis to, you know, to Malachi all their life, and here's this man saying, I came to finish his work that sent me, and they know he's referring to God, and they're confused about what that means. Because they know all the laws that I've taught you in the last several 10, 11, 12 weeks, whatever. And Jesus just said, I came to finish something. Because the first Adam left some things undone. What were they? Well, he lost his assignment. He lost his dominion. He, he could not finish. He could not have dominion on the earth. He had lost that right, that privilege. Are you listening? Okay, and so the work of God for man to have dominion on the earth was incomplete. It wasn't finished. So that's what Jesus came to do was to show us how, give us the understanding of how we need to carry on what God's original assignment was for mankind. And that is to bring forth fruit for the kingdom. That is, to re that is to produce his word. That is to bring forth those things that will honor God, to take back what the devil stole. That's, I don't know how to make it any simpler, amen? To take back. What has the devil stole? Well, he stole man's ability to, to, uh, to, in, to, to rest and have peace. He put him under the curse to toil and strive and, you know, and just... And just do, do everything he can and get stressed out. He took all of that away from us. 
that what God intended was that we would live by, in peace and by faith and understanding that, man, what we put our hands to, God will prosper. There is work to do, but God says, I want you to do it my way. You follow me? Have dominion. He stole man's health. The curse stole man's health. The curse stole man's wealth. The curse stole mankind's, you know, provision of God. So when he said this, this, this parable here, he's telling them, you know, I came to finish what the first Adam didn't finish. He lost his perspective about his assignment from God. He couldn't do it. The law couldn't get it done, amen? He had to have faith. And so he goes on to say, now, he's going to really enrich this a little bit. And he says, now, so to, to, in order to highlight, you know, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So how many of you know everything Jesus did was the will of God? Every time he healed, every time he delivered, every time he overcame a demonic spirit, every time he ever opened a blind eye, every time he healed the lame, every time he had provision, every time he, he did the miraculous. Come on, now you know that everything he did was bringing forth the will of the Father. He overcame the natural things that, were, that would stumble, that cause us to stumble, amen? He overcame those things. I mean, he superseded, supernatural, and his, his life was just like that. And it was to do the will of the Father. That's my point. How many of you know it was to do the will and to finish the work? So he says, now let me highlight this. He said, standing there, I can just see him standing out on one of the fields there in, in, the, in, in, in the southern part of Israel, southern central part of Israel, and he goes, he said, look. Let me show you what I mean. He said, now you say that there's four months after you plant a seed and then you get a harvest. But then he said, behold. Everybody say behold. I won't tell you what that word is. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. For they're already white to harvest. Now, you know, when your eyes, when he says look up, what's the first thing you do? Or you look up, and you look at what he's telling you to look at, the fields. Now, they just planted them. There's nothing there. But he saw something. That's amazing to me. See, that's what faith does. I mean, I see what the natural looks like, but I've got to develop eyesight that sees beyond that. I've got to develop a vision that has the ability to see what the natural man can't see. And isn't that what calls? It's called faith, right? Believing is seeing. And so the word behold means look closer. In other words, what you don't see. You know, uh, there's a, the, the world is draped in camouflage. How many of you know that? I mean, the, you, you can look at a person, you understand, and you don't know whether that person is a terrorist or a, or, or a, a rapist or a murderer or a thief or whatever. You, you see the natural. And, you know, man has a way of persuading and convincing you, oh, that he's all that. You know, oh, not, none of that. And then the next thing you know, man, you're in a battle. Amen? Why? Because there's a something behind that. There's a spirit that drives everything. And I'm going to show you that in Isaiah in a minute. There's an origin. There's something that motivates culture and, and the way people think. Are you listening? And we've got to be able to see what the Lord has for us to see now. So this word behold means to look closer, examine it a little closer, look a little closer, look beyond the camouflage, start getting some discernment, amen? You know, don't, don't be mistrusting, but understand that there's some things, there's some reasons why people are fighting against the curse. In fact, Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 says, as a bird fluttereth and the sparrow wanders, he said, so the curse causeless cannot come. Are you listening? Come on now. I mean, we got to be able to be, you know, forthright here. We got to be able to understand that this is this is how we learn what Jesus is teaching. There's a reason for the curse. There's a reason for the blessing. And so, here he's teaching him something spiritually speaking. He said, "Behold, look closer. What do you really see? Can you just see the disciples? See, they would have understood when he said that word in the Greek. You know, in in, in his language, he would have. They would have been." Don't see it. <laughs> you don't see the harvest? I mean, can you see the Lord just standing there 
with these guys and there. He's trying to bring them out of their, their life of nature, their life of being a natural man, which is what we are. But he's trying to take them to where they'll, they'll understand that there's something beyond time and space. <laughs> are you listening? He's trying to get them to see that, that you know, what your eyes see is not the, not the end result. You don't see the end result. You're waiting on the result. You're, in, you're locked into this process of time and space. Mm. So the word behold, seeing the boundless, limitless, what I wrote down, that seeing the boundless, limitless reality of eternity, <laughs> the glory that the Father desires to bring forth. See, you've got to see that before you're ever going to live that. You've got to be able to see that. Now, you know, some of you are looking like you're kind of confused. But I mean, I'm telling you, this is the basic principle of faith. This is what he's teaching. Standing there with a the feel. I, I want to say it again so you kind of grab what, try to, try to feel like what they must have been feeling like when Jesus shows them a plowed up field and he says, you know, now you're waiting four months for a harvest, but I'm telling you, look what he said. Lift up your eyes. Now, what he's saying right there is look beyond. Lift up. See beyond time and space. Go to Isaiah chapter 40. We'll come back here in a minute. There's another time that Isaiah said words very similar to this. I want to show them to you. I love these passages. Isaiah chapter 40. Lift up your eyes. Now, in the natural, what do you do? You look up. Then what do you see? What does your faith see? What does your heart see? It's going to see what you believe. All right? Now, here's an example that was in Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm just going to start right on top of the Scripture itself and not go through the ones before and the ones. We'll, we'll read some after. But verse 26, Isaiah 40, lift up your eyes. There you see it again. On high, and behold, look a little closer. Examine it. All right? Who hath created? Behold, who hath created these things? That brings out their hosts by number. He calls them by names by the greatness of his might. For he that is strong in power, and not one faileth. Now, okay, if we were to walk outside, beautiful moon. How many of you saw the beautiful moon tonight? Isn't that beautiful? You know, and, and you go out there and you look up at nighttime, and it's on these clear nights like this, and you look up, what do you see? You see stars all over the place, don't you? How many of you just like to look at the stars? Well, you know, here Isaiah saying, lift up your eyes and look. And what do you see? You see stars twinkling up in the sky, don't you? But there's something that's holding them up there. There's something that put them there. See, if, you, if, if that's all you see, then you're a scientist. Come on, somebody. Now, but if you, if you start looking at that and you say, and you get amazed and you say, I can't even count them, but God named them. Oh, wow. That puts some perspective of greatness on it, doesn't it? So he's saying the same thing. He said, when you look, don't just see the natural. Don't just see what your natural eyes see. You got to look beyond that. You got to know that there's a God that said, and look, and he said, notice he said, not one faileth. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. You know, science has all these instruments and all these things, and they think they're seeing all this stuff, and, you know, and they're seeing stars disappear and stars blow up. I'm not so sure about all that. <laughs> well, yeah, they proved it. They ain't proved nothing. That's like saying they proved that dinosaurs are real. Then you find out that all the pictures they created are not really dinosaurs. That was an imaginary. Oh, come on now, y'all. Oh, boy, we're, we're stomping on some science tonight. Yeah, they found a few little bones, and they said, well, if this bone is this big, then that bone's got to be this big. So they come up with this creature, you know, and he's got arms this long. can't even reach his mouth. Now, what kind of a god would create an animal? I can't even, I can't feed himself. So they had to make his head big enough to eat a, eat a man, you know. 
But paleontologists have already admitted that they have never found a complete structure. They just kind of come up with that by, you know, by their scientific, well, if this one's this big, then that one's got to be that big. It's theory. Oh, my goodness. I can see now we're, we're, we're stomping on some scientist believers in here. You know, you know, when you look beyond and you look at the, at the creation and the creator and you start seeing things bigger, well, anything could be possible. Sure it could. But this illustration is lift up your eyes on high and behold, who hath created these things? Well, I can't see him, but I can see his work. And that's kind of what Jesus is trying to get us to see. If you can't see his work before it happens, you ain't never going to experience it. Come on, if you can't make God bigger than your little problems, if you can't see beyond, you understand, then you're never going to see it in the natural. You can, you can spout off words, you can know your theology, you can do all that stuff you want to, but the reason we don't see the manifestations is because all we see is the natural. Everything that governs how we think, what we see, is always natural. If the doctor looks at an x-ray and says, you got this on your body, you got to be able to see something beyond that. God didn't put that there. And if you want it gone by God's hand, you're going to have to see beyond that. Come on. <laughs> Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest thou, O Israel, my way is hid from you, from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? From my God? Hast thou not known that thou hast not heard that everything God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not grow weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, the word wait right there, well, because I, in our language, what does that mean? Oh, religion is, loves that word. When we don't, when, when, when we still, when every day we look at the natural and we say, well, it hadn't happened yet. Well, you know, God's not moving yet. Well, you know why? Because your eyes are only looking at what you see. They that wait upon the Lord. So religion jumps all over that one. Well, you just got to wait on the Lord. <laughs> God's timing is not our timing. <laughs> See, Jesus was trying to straighten up some of that stuff. Maybe God's timing is our timing. Maybe God's timing is when we see what his word says. And that governs what we see and how we think. Well, the word wait right there is not a time word. The way that they use this word, if you looked it up by definition, they got good, good software out there now. You can look it up. Put your little cursor over that thing. It'll tell you what that word means if you got a good translation. It means to mold together to become one with. Wow. It means to become one. Doesn't that sound like covenant? They that wait upon the Lord are those that, that begin to mesh themselves together with him. They begin to look at his creation and they, that nothing is impossible and their faith just rises up. To where they understand they're not bound by, by age. They're not bound by time and space. Their strength is not determined by the natural, but they begin to see and they begin to understand that you can do what God called you here to do. But you got to mold you got to mesh you got to be you got to like like weaving a rope together is the literal definition they that wait upon the lord they become one agreement is a, another word for it amen so what if we read it like that they that agree with the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. We'll talk about eagles maybe next week. But tonight, if we put that word in that place, which would be a, a, a better, really better translation, uh, or a more English better translation, they that agree with the Lord. Now, when Jesus would teach something like, <laughs> what do you see? 
a plowed up field ready to harvest in four months? He said, I don't see that. I see something already there. Wow, that's amazing. So they that agree with the Lord, that's who gets their strength back. That's who mounts up with wings of eagles. That's who runs and not grow weary. That's who walks and not faints. Why? Because they're on assignment. Because they're seeing what, what the Lord says. Now go back to John chapter 4. We'll do some more with that maybe next week or whenever. Back to John. Let's finish it up. John chapter 4. Y'all getting anything out of this? I love this stuff, man. I mean, you know, that's what I like on Wednesday nights. I like kind of just trying to, trying to teach it to you, doing the best I can. So he goes and he goes, okay, lift up your eyes. You remember, behold, examine it. You know, do you see what's beyond that? Do you see what's really? I mean, when you see evil, do you see God behind that? See, if you do, you're not seeing it right. You see, if, you, if you're under the persuasion that something's going wrong and you see evil happening and all of a sudden you start tagging that on God's provision, you, you're seeing it wrong. You're seeing the wrong God. You're seeing the deception that the enemy wants you to see. Come on now. So what am I supposed to see? Well, believing is the seeing in God's kingdom. And so Jesus here goes, lift up your eyes and look under the fields. He's using that example, for they are white all ready to harvest. Okay. And he that reapeth receives wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal. All right, he that reapeth in a field of dirt and just seeds out there. What are you talking about, Lord? Well, you know, to receive is the same thing as reaping. Receiving the end result, that's what faith does. Receiving the finished product. Receiving when I can't see, taste, touch, or smell it yet. You see, that's, that's what faith does. It has to. All right? And so he says, he that reapeth or receiveth, is, it, that receives is one that re like one that receives wages. Let me ask you a question in, in our modern day terminology. You know, someone that works 40 hours a week, what are they working for? Everybody, come on now. I mean, do y'all go to work for nothing? I don't know. Maybe you do. If you do, come on by. We, we can use you over here too. You know, we can. Are you listening? So you believe that at the end of that week, you're going to have a what? But now you're doing 40 hours worth of work before you ever get that, right? Why? Because you believe that you're going to have it at the end of it. Right? You wouldn't go to work otherwise, would you? I mean, you'd find somewhere else. If, a guy, if someone told you, hey, look. You're going to come to work for me. I'm going to pay you X amount of wages for, for, for your labor. And, and at the end of it, if they don't give you a check, you're not going to stay there too long, are you? At some point, you're going to say, now, I've been duped, man. Something's wrong with this. I mean, I, you know, I like you and all. <laughs> but this is not feeding my family. This is not putting bread on the table. There, there's something wrong. I'm doing all the work, and I'm not getting any wage for it. I'm not, getting any, I'm not receiving anything for it. But the point is, when you start out Monday looking at Friday, you're, everything you're doing is because you know that on Friday, what's going to happen? You're going to get a check. And what Jesus is saying right here is, when you see the things that I'm trying to teach, he said, you got the check before you do the work. That's what faith does. See how it kind of, in the kingdom of God, it just kind of works different. But see, when in our modern day way of faith, then, then we got to do enough work so that we can get the reward. And see, then it becomes by works and not by faith. And there's no grace in that. That means God owes you something. But when you start out the right way in your faith and you see, like he said, look, I see a field already white, ready for harvest. When you start out there, even though you don't see it yet, then your labor is a totally different understanding. <laughs> I believe I receive my healing. Why? Because the Word says so. Well, the Word's already the finished product. Jesus proved it. It's mine. I'm not trying to get this. It's already been harvested. It's already proven itself. It's good seed. Amen? So he's saying here, the example of he that reapeth or receiveth receives wages, and he gathers. 
And both he that soweth and he that reapeth rejoice together. Now, who's he that soweth? Wouldn't Jesus be talking about himself right there? He says, when you believe me without seeing, when you take what I've given you, when you believe what I said and you see the way I see things, he said, we're going to rejoice together. Because he said, I'm going to manifest what you're believing for. Because you've got the right attitude towards it. Boy, isn't that dynamic in faith? That's, that's about, man, y'all are acting like you know this. That's boring you to death. <laughs> See, I know that if you knew this, things would be different. This place would be so full of people trying to beat their way in here, man, to find out what you've got, so much blessing. Why? Because I know that's what the world out there is after. They just ain't seeing the church produce anything. They're still watching the Trinity, CBS, NBC, and ABC. They're still believing all that stuff, man. I know there's a $16 trillion debt. I'm rejoicing. You know why? Because, man, I got a God. See, that's impossible for man to fix. I don't care who it is or who says they can. <laughs> but I got a God that's bigger than $16 trillion worth of debt. I got a God that said, I'm going to raise up a people that's going to be lenders and not borrowers. They're going to be the head, not the tail. They're going to be above and not beneath. I, I see that, man. I don't, know, I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I see the field white for harvest. Are you listening to me? You ain't worried about all that. You ain't losing no sleep over that. Man, I wake up. I'm rejoicing. I'm glad, man. I can't wait. Look, go ahead. Pile it on. Because my God's not sleeping. Hmm. He that reapeth in that field that already white that they can't see with their eyes, but he that receives it, he said, man, <laughs> they're going to rejoice together. And then he says, and herein is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap whereupon you bestowed no labor, but others, the prophets before you. That, that spoke the word against all odds, that saw that there was coming a Messiah. You see, the image of the Messiah in man's eyes was totally different. You see, Israel had a big problem with seeing the natural, and they had all this expectation. And you know what? I tell people like this, you know, they were looking for the conquering king. Why? Because they needed deliverance. They were in bondage. They were, they were suffering. They were hurting. They weren't fulfilling Deuteronomy. They weren't fulfilling the, the blessings of God. Are you listening now? And so they were looking for this Messiah that was going to come as the lion, and he was going to deliver them, and he was going to take them out from their troubles and their bondage, and, and he was going to be their king. And they were going to march with him, swords drawn, and march over, tap dance on the head of their enemies. And they were looking for the lion, and they missed the lamb. Because the way God delivers is by the lamb. Come on, somebody. And our perception, you see, they were looking for the wrong thing. When you're looking for the wrong thing, you're going to miss the right thing. And that's what religion has done to our generation. We don't know how to believe. We're a culture of church instead of being the church. We've created this culture that has about as much power as attacking something with a butter knife when you need a bazooka. And the enemy's laughing all the way, making, making it look like we believe God. Listen, our God is this God. Jesus is trying to teach them. He said, I sent you to reap. Now, I'll close with this. Praise team, come on back up. The expectation of faith. To reap is to receive. Here he's teaching to receive by believing, all right, from his finished work. What Jesus did was to show us the word in action, amen? What happens when the word, what happens in obedience to the Father? What happens when we commit our ways unto him? What happens when we are not just playing around with theology, but we actually got some Eyes to see what can't be seen in the natural. You know, a lot of people are scared to, to step out on that, in that realm. Brother, stay quiet. Man, listen, we need to be bold about, you know. I mean, come on now, let me ask you this. Is our God big enough to get us through difficult times? Well, this is what he said in Timothy. He said it like this. He said, to have a form of godliness... 
with no power is a sitting duck for the enemy. It allows him to creep into people's houses and just lead them astray and just, just knock their feet out from under them. How many of you believe God really is powerful as the God that hung the stars in the heavens? How many of you believe when you look up there, you can see something beyond that? And I can't see him with my natural eye, but I see the results of what he did. And I love to go out there. You can show the, I mean, I'm about as goofy as can be, I guess. I'll go out there and sit sometimes at night and just, I love to look up the stars. Every now and then I'll see a shooting star. <laughs> Every now and then I'll see some, some things going on, you know, that, that just fascinate me. Amen? You know, it's fun to look at. But I'm, I'm really, you know, I had a guy, I had, a, I had an, uh, an optometrist told me this one time. How many of you know what an optometrist is? It's an eye doctor, right? He, he's an optometrist. And uh, he said that, do you realize, he said that if you could lay out on your back on a clear night and look up at the stars in the heavens, your eyes would readjust. Isn't that amazing? I said, really? I don't know how long that would take, but it, you know. <laughs> I said, that's pretty interesting. I mean, isn't it amazing how science can figure that out? Now, how would that work? I have no idea. No more than I can tell you how you can take an antibiotic and it'll attack a flu. I don't know how that works. But there's things that, that God does that's just fascinating. It's on purpose. So when I look up there, I think about, man, my little old situation here. Huh. I got to start seeing what this word says. See, when I reap this out of here and put it in my heart, it's supposed to give me a vision. I got to see myself well. I got to see myself prospering. I've got to see myself overcoming. I've got to see myself with a victory. I've got to see that lump gone. I've got to see that situation turning. I've got to see that loved one bowing his knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got to see that that, that hatred is going away. I've got to see, come on somebody, you listening to me? I've got to, I've got to look and see what the Lord sees. Otherwise, I'm going to see the work of something else. And if that governs my thinking... I'm in trouble. Jesus was teaching them the same thing that we've got to learn. Believing is seeing. Amen? Believing is seeing in the kingdom of God. Is that easy to do? Absolutely not. It's much easier to see what you see. Jesus didn't teach that way. So if you're ever going to see God, you're going to have to see his results according to his word before come on now it's the way it works I wish it was easier than that you know there's times Jody and I talk from time to time I said man <laughs> this thing gets hard it gets hard it gets difficult right we talk about that it's time to time it's like man does it ever stop what happens is Sunday morning I'm going to tell you some testimonies on, on the other side I'm going to tell you some things when I started out in faith, believing with all my heart, and something happened along the way, and the vision didn't come to pass. And it wasn't because God did something. And it wasn't because necessarily that I missed God in the beginning. But I really didn't have faith to believe it all the way through to the end because I lost my vision, spiritually speaking. I began to look back at the circumstances, and it robbed me of my faith. But you know the good part about God is all you got to do is go reap some more. Go back there. Start back at where you're supposed to start. Start Focus your vision. Let this bring that focus like looking at the stars. Let this bring that, that clarity to your vision. Amen. And start seeing what God says. It's not easy. If it were, man, this would be a totally different place. This world. You know, people are always looking for things that God created anyway. They want to enjoy the things that God has designed, has put on this earth. Man may have figured out how to design the silver wings of an airplane and fly into the heavens, but you know, 
He got that material from somewhere. He learned things somehow. Man can figure out certain things, but it should always lead him to God. Amen? When it starts leading us in a different direction, something's wrong. 